The skeleton approach is rooted in the understanding that you account for the success of groups based on the intent of the individual to give unconditionally. Um, we have an example, for instance, of this of three bakers. Let's say, for instance, we have three bakers who collaborate to bake a cake. It takes them the whole month to bake that cake, and at the end of the month, the cake is sold. And each one of them takes a slice home to feed their family. And clearly, there's a slice left after they've done that. We would call the slice that's left the surplus, and we would measure the success of the enterprise based on the size of that slice vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the cake. The bigger the slice is with regard to the rest of the, the cake, the more successful we'll deem the enterprise to be. Now, if this is the case, we need to understand why the slice exists in the first place. Surely the slice only exists because the total cake that was baked was bigger than what each individual took home. In other words, collectively, these people gave more than what they took. So you account for the difference between successful and unsuccessful groups based on the intent of the individual to make a discretionary and unconditional contribution to the organization. Now, in our experience, there are three reasons why people make a discretionary and unconditional contribution to an organization. The first reason is cultural. Some organizations or some cultures are just better at cultivating a sense of good citizenship in the individuals involved. The second reason is that the group's uh, purpose for being there, the group's mission, if you like, is what we would call a benevolent intent. It's noble enough for people to go the extra mile. But the most profound reason for people going the extra mile, in fact, is not the organization. It is who's the boss. Because in my experience, people go the extra mile for people. So if you want to understand the conditions under which somebody is going to work for because they really want to, then ask yourself not uh, what is the organization they work for because they want to, but who's the boss that they work for because they want to. Now, in our experience, that if you ask the average boss how they view their role, if they would say to you, um, actually being in charge, being the boss, the lead, being the leader is about achieving a result through people. And there's a problem with that framing because that framing basically is, an, is a taking framing. And to understand this, we need to um, do a little bit of a thought experiment. Let's say, for instance, you've got two people working for you, Fred and Joe, and you say to Fred, uh, Fred, in 1980, I did what you have to do now and what I did work. Don't argue with me. Go and do what I did. You say to Joe, Joe, in 1980, I did what you have to do now and what I did worked. It may be helpful to you take a look at it. If the question is which one of these are going to work for you because they have to and which is going to work for you because they want to, clearly Fred's going to work because he has to and Joe's going to work for you because he wants to. And the question is why? What makes those two interactions different? Well, in order to understand that, you need to separate two variables in your mind, means and ends. And you need to put into those two categories either the person who's doing the job or the job that's being done and the result that's being achieved. So if we examine the Fred interaction, if you said to Fred in 1980, I did what you have to do and what did it work, don't argue with me, go shut up and do what I did. Then basically your intent is to get the job done and you're using Fred, the person, as your resource to do so. If we assumed you were being sincere with Joe, uh, if you said to him, in 1980, I did what you have to do and it worked, it may be helpful to you take a look, you could have a completely different outcome from what you had in 1980. In fact, the, the outcome might be a disaster. So, so your intent in the Joe interaction isn't to get the same job done. Your intent is actually to teach Joe something. Your end is the person. And what gives you the opportunity to teach Joe something is the job that they're doing. So there's an inversion of means and ends. Now, that inversion of means and ends tells you that there's been a shift in the intent of the engagement, which is really the critical variable here. If you asked Fred, who's the beneficiary of the interaction between you, you, you and your boss? Fred is going to say, it's the boss. The boss is trying to take something from me. If you ask Joe, who's the beneficiary? Joe would say, it's myself. The boss is trying to give me something. Now, clearly, if you define leadership as achieving a result through people, that's acting consistently with the Fred interaction. If you wanted to act consistently with a Joe interaction, you would have to say something like, leadership is about achieving people through results. Now, that sounds rather bizarre, but that's exactly what a coach does. A coach's job, in fact, is to coach a player. He's got to understand what's happening on the field and what's happening on the scoreboard. He uses that as his means in order to coach the player.
The coach does not use the player to get a job done and to achieve a result. He uses the result as his means to enable the player. Now, what does that mean in terms of time? Uh, if we look at this whole issue of what the intent to give means, it means that it will affect what you give attention to because what you give attention to and what you spend time on is what is important to you. Now, there's, there's a way of approaching time which is variously called either the Eisenhower model or the Covey time management model. I suspect that Covey stole it from Eisenhower. Um, um, but um, uh, it, it really says if you look at all the things you could conceivably spend time on, you can either spend time on things that are urgent or you can spend time things on things that are not urgent. You could also spend time on things that are, unimp are important or you can spend time on things that are not important. So clearly we've got two interacting variables and we therefore have a four quadrant model. And each one of those quadrants has a different diagnostic implication in terms of the success of where you spend your time or what you spend your time on. The first quadrant, this quadrant one, is, is the quadrant of things that you experience as both urgent and important. So these are results-focused activities. These are dealing with deadlines. These are dealing with crises. They're all things that have a sense of urgency about them that really have to be given attention to immediately. Now, uh, what this, how this translates into the issue of intent, you see, is that if you look at what you can construct your intent on, in any situation that you can construct your intent on, you can either construct your intent on what you're getting or on what you're giving. Now, the problem with any outcome is any outcome that is really concerned with what you're getting. So by definition, quadrant one activities are concerned with activities that sit over here. They're concerned with what you're getting. And the problem with putting attention on things that sit over there is that you don't have control over the things that sit there because you don't have you only have control over what sits in your own hands. So in other words, while you stay in quadrant one activities, you stay in a sense disabled. You stay feeling out of control and constantly visited by crises and problems. Um, the next quadrant we can discuss is that, is, is that which, which Covey refers to as quadrant three activities. And these are activities that are urgent but not important. So these are things like interruptions and emails and calls. I mean, you know, if you look at your calendar, you say, oh, heavens, I've got to get to a meeting now. Um, uh, that, that seems like it's urgent. It makes an urgent uh, kind of call on your attention. And you might sit in the meeting and not say a word for two hours. Um, uh, so it's not added any value at all. So a lot of our time gets spent on activities that are that present themselves as urgent to us, but they aren't particularly important. Quadrant four activities are, are really just time wasters. It's sort of computer games, um, you know, and, and we all have little things that we do to kind of fritter away time, um, uh, just because um, you, you know we don't know what else to do with ourselves. Now, quadrant two activities are really the interesting ones because quadrant two activities are things like doing preventative things. They doing long term planning, relationship building. These are what Covey would call sharpening the saw activities. And he has a metaphor for this. He says, assume that you're walking through a forest one day and you come across a woodcutter who's busy cutting down a tree with a blunt saw. And you can see the saw's blunt and you go, you know, the man's working very hard. He's sweating. You go up to him and you say, listen, why don't you stop for a moment and just sharpen the saw? And he looks at you exasperated. He says, for heaven's sake, leave me alone. Can't you see I'm busy? Clearly, the woodcutter's busy because he's trying to get the tree down. He's concerned with the result. He's concerned with the outcome. He doesn't realize that if he worked on his process, if he sharpened his saw, then in fact, he would get the result a lot quicker. So by definition, sharpening the saw activities really are concerned with what sits in your own hand, what you're giving or what you're doing. It's about your process, whereas quadrant one activities are about outcomes, which means to suggest that if we want to have an empowered kind of experience of things, we need to give attention to what we have power over. We need to give attention to our process. We need to shift our attention from outcome into process. Quadrant two activities are by definition 
process focused activities. Now, what that means in an organizational setting and what that means for a leader is the first thing leaders have to understand is that generally the, the sort of results that they're trying to achieve and the crisis that, have been, that they've been faced with really doesn't have much to do with them because really the results are normally concerned with what a worker does. So the result is the outcome of what the worker's activity and even from the worker's point of view, if you wanted to get a good result, then, then, then you, you, want to, you would want to sharpen the worker's saw. You'd want to improve what sits over here because what sits over here is consistent with sharpening the saw for the worker. Now, if we were to take our insight then a level up in the hierarchy, so what does that mean for this, the, the worker's uh, boss, the supervisor, the overseer, if you like, that the worker reports to? then clearly the overseer does certain tasks himself. That's his own process. But the rest of what he does gets delivered through the worker. And we know that, in fact, a leader's job is to care and grow the people working for him. And if we say growth, growth means to give the subordinate the means to do what's required, to care for the subordinate, rather, and then to give the subordinate the means to do what's required of them, to make them able to do what's required of them, and to hold them accountable. Now, the results that get achieved in the overseer's area, that's the outcome that he's concerned with. And if he focuses on that, he's going to stay stuck in deadlines and crises and, 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 and problems, if you like. He will only get a real sense of having control over the situations that he's in when he finds out what his own process is. When he realizes, for instance, that the reason why there's a crisis or there's a result issue is because this person isn't doing a particular task properly because they, in fact, aren't able to do it. So he's got to make that person able. So in other words, the overseer's process is what sits over here, is to do whatever tasks he has to do himself properly, is to care for the subordinate, give the subordinate the means, the ability and the accountability to do what's required of them. And then obviously a similar logic could go all the way up the line. So if we're looking at the overseer's boss, then that boss also seeks to achieve a result and she will do certain things herself to achieve the result. The rest of what she does gets delivered to her through the overseer. Her job is to care for and grow the earth. That's her process. And if we wanted to have an empowered boss, one that isn't a set, suffering from this idea of, of always being out of control, then we need to focus her attention on uh, fr from, her, from her outcome, from her result, to her process, what she should be doing herself. She needs to be spending time on her process, on what sits over here. Now, if we consider what that would mean from a diary point of view, it suggests that the leader would diarize events that would be consistent with the tasks that she's doing herself, the care, means, and ability and accountability that she should be giving her direct subordinate. So what does that mean specifically? Let's have a look at what that means in terms of a diary. The leader would diarize what she's giving attention to. Well, what would the leader diarize if she was giving attention to the care and growth of a subordinate? So let's first look at what that means with regard to care. The leader, for instance, would ask herself, have I diarized significant dates in my subordinate's life? Like the subordinate's birthday, like anniversaries the subordinate might have, other things like children's birthdays and things like that. Also, do I spend enough time to discuss personal concerns with my subordinate? Um, do I dedicate that amount? Do I put time in my calendar to just go and shoot the breeze to find out what's happening in my subordinate's life? The next thing that the, uh, the boss would then deliberately give attention to and spend time on is what means the subordinate requires to do their job. For instance, do I spend enough one-on-one -on -one time with every one of my subordinates? In fact, do I give my subordinates my time? Because my time is a critical means that the subordinate requires. Have I diarized time to investigate whether each one of my subordinates have the resources and the tools and the authority to do what's required of them? Do I spend time in my subordinates area trying to understand what they're struggling with and trying to understand whether it's a means or an ability issue? 
when we're looking at the issue of ability, does the boss should ask yourself, do I know that, what my, that my subordinates are clear on what they're trying to achieve? Also, what would I need to go and watch and what would I need to spend time on if I wanted to get an understanding of my subordinates' ability? Finally, if we look at the issue of accountability, the first thing the boss would ask himself is, is the subordinate standard clear? Do they know what's required of them? And if the performance is above standard, do I recognize them or reward them appropriately? And if it's not above standard, um, if it's below standard, do I dedicate enough time, the, the time required to discipline them appropriately? So what all of this means then, in conclusion, is that the leader would speak being here to give means the leader spends time on how she spends time. She looks diagnostically at the last month and she would check in her calendar whether she's dedicated enough time to her own process. In other words, she would do a diary audit. And once having decided, using these criteria of means, ability and accountability that she should be giving to her subordinate, she would then plan into the future um, what diary entries she would be um, adding in order to enable her subordinates proper, properly. Finally, once the leader has diagnosed what she would be giving attention to in the future, she would stick to those commitments. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.